Okay, so we are very happy to have uh, Francis at Howard san from Benin in Africa. So wonderful guest. So he'll talk about the particles and periodic integrals of spin half. So please start. Okay, thank you. Um, I would give a talk on particles and periodic integrals of spin half. We shall look at the spin Lie group, especially the periodic form of the spin Lie group, and we shall consider some RPQ gamma and RPQ beta functions. We shall also look at the ghosts of the polynomial and see some applications. Um, it's actually a joint work with my supervisors, Professor Hunkonu and Professor Kanji from the University of Abome Kalavi. Okay, so for the overview, we shall look at some motivations. Then we would consider the periodic spin Lie group. We also consider the spin, the zeta functions, and we would also look at the R, RPQ gamma and beta functions. And we also consider the fermionic periodic Q integrals, as well as the periodic rho, P, rho Q gamma functions. And we'll look at some examples of the periodic string amplitude and make some conclusion remarks. The concept of periodic analysis has many applications in mathematics and in physics, especially in string theory, where they, they are used to look at the world volume theory or also the deep brain of bosonic strings, which contains um, a tachyonic mode. Now, um, Sm Smirnov considered the periodic version of the Feynman amplitude, and he gave a generalization for its n points massless. Dragovich and many others also considered the periodic gravity and the wave function of the universe. Dragovich is advocating that the world or the, the or matter is made up of periodic. So he has a term that he has formed, coined out of his research, which is called the periodic matter. Zabrodin was also able to find the, using the wet sheet, he was able to find the periodic strength of, and he considered the Bruhat test tree of this um, strength. Now, there are many applications that are possible. You could, we could look at a, 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 an article written by Peter G. O. Freund, which is periodic strings then and now. He has spoken about many applications of the periodics in string theory and supersymmetry. So, sorry, I have one naive question. Okay. So usually amplitude is a real number. Yes. The periodic number would be different from the, the real, real number. number. Yes. So absolutely. how to get to finally the real number from this formalism? Okay, we will consider um, the norm of these versions. And normally the periodic, as I, I'll start explaining very soon how we move from a periodic to the, from the real case to the periodic, which is a completion of the closure in the rational numbers. I would start with a very good explanation from there. Because most of these are Archimedean. The real numbers are Archimedean. But in the periodic, we consider the non-Archimedean, where we take the absolute values or the mod or the norm of um, the integers. So mm -hmm. I will give further details on this one. Oh, will, will you explain later? Yes, I will explain. Oh, okay, okay. I, 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 wait. Thank you very much. Okay, so in this talk, we shall try to answer the following questions. We shall look at are fermion spin Lie groups periodic? We want to look at the fact that the fermion spin Lie group is a periodic. Now, we also consider the Iwasawa algebras of the spin half Lie algebras. We will also look at the periodic zeta functions for the spin half. And finally, we shall look at some extending the results of T Kim on the fermionic and bosonic Q integrals to the RPQ deformation developed by Nkonu. 
We shall also consider some examples and see how they relate to periodic amplitude strength theory. Thank you. So for this, currently, uh, Edgar Hernandez has completed a very good dissertation in that was February 2023 on periodic string amplitude. And that is a very good dissertation. You, we could look at that also. So I start with what a periodic number is. If, if it's possible, can you pin me to the board? Can, 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 the, can we pin to the board so that I use just the board? If it's possible to pin me from your end. Prof. Hello, Prof. Hello, Prof. Can you pin the... Uh, sorry? sorry. Uh... Can, can you pin to the board? Can you pin the, the, the video strictly to the board? Okay, let me see this way so that we can have only, um, uh... only the board. There is a way to pin to the board. Uh, so sorry, I I've, I've not yet understand that. Okay. If, if do you want to? Yes. If I write and it's clear, you you can let me know. Okay. Ah. Yes. You you have to. Okay. You have to stop the screen sharing first. Okay. Yeah. First, then I can pin. Ah, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So is it is it okay? Can you see? From yeah, okay, here? I can see. Yeah. Thank you. So periodic numbers. Now for a periodic number, we shall take let's p be prime numbers, and uh, we when when we talk of prime numbers, we are talking about these numbers up to p minus one. Now we will take an element, any element in P, then we will look at how we can now define the periodic for P. We take X such so that the P, the periodic number, the, um, the prime number, raised to the power N, A divided by P, where B is greater than zero. The value of B is greater than zero. This is the definition of a periodic uh, um, X when we are talking about periodics. Now, the GCD, the greatest common divisor of A and B should be one. When we have this condition and we have B greater than zero, then we also know that um, our ABC, A, our AB and our N, are all integers in the set of integers, then we can say that the x has the form of a periodic. Now we would be able to describe the valuation on x and look at when x is non Archimedean. So when I take a valuation of x, for instance, I take, I take x belonging to z. Now, for this, I take the norm of s. And the norm of s, when we look at it with regards to the p, is defined as follows. We will define it as p 1 over the order. We have, we have p 1 over the order of p with respect to x, and 0 and this happens when we have x to be zero, x to not to be zero. In this case, when we have x to be zero, we get an infinity. Now, in the real number, we are always aware of the fact that the, the real number system, R, the real number system R is an Archimedean system. Now to move from R to the QP, where we are looking at closures 
in, in the rational um, number, we would have to now consider the, the P to be only prime numbers. And this is how we move from this um, infinity to P. We consider the non archimedean We consider the non archimedean We state that one, the norm of X with respect to this should be zero or greater than zero and two. We have that the norm of X plus Y with respect to P should be the norm of X plus the norm of Y. Now we also have that the norm of X times Y with respect to P should be equal to the norm of X P with the norm of Y P. Where we have our X, where we have our X Y to be in Z P. Now, when we consider elements of X and Y in this, we can now define the, the, the ultrametric valuation. When we look at the ultrametric, we look at the ultrametric to be the maximum. When we have X plus Y of P, it is the maximum of norm of X, P, and that of the norm of the Y. And this definition is what we call the ultrametric in the periodic case. So for any periodic number, we are interested in the behavior of the number in this form. So somebody would ask, if I have an order of five to 35, where P is five, the prime is five, what will be the order of five in 35? And this is one, because five goes into 35 just one time, and it's only a one uh, prime number that is making this possible. When I take order of two to 97, order of two to 97 is zero, because we do not have any prime that is able to uh, divide 97. Now we can look at an example when I take order of two to 96. Yes, order of two to 96 would be five because two can go into the 96 when we look at the, um, the prime order five times. And from this, we are able to now move on to further applications of the prime of the periodic numbers. With every periodic number, it is possible to associate a series to it. So when we have when we have x or a of when we have a, a value a of um, n belonging to the set of integers, we can say that the sum of the sum of a n and b n belongs to the periodic. It converges, and this sum converges when n approaches infinity. And this is true because of the property of the Cauchy sequence and the behavior of the norm. Now, from this, we can also take elements that are in that are in Z. So if I have my set of integer with respect to P, I want to look at this relation, the quotient of the ring of ZP, P, and ZP. This is just um, regarded as just a, a family. And in this family, one can have an isomorphism from this family to the quotient of that. 
And this isomorphism has been proven to be very useful, especially when we are dealing with primes um, of or with primes and piatic from this quotient, the ring of this quotient to the ring of that quotient. Some properties from this can be related by inverse limits. And the inverse limit makes it very possible for us to see the behavior of this. Now, from there, I want to look at groups or groups that behave in that form, in this form. When we take the general linear group or the two by two matrix, we take J of L to Q of P. Let me first use Q of P. Now, this group is just the two by two matrix, two by two matrices of this form, A, B, C, D, such that A, B, C, and D is in, that the A, B, C, and D is in that, now, I'm interested in its closure being in, uh, in, in, in Z. And the determinants, when I take this, the determinant, I can take it from there, from the Z. The determinant of this, the determinant of this group should be, of the group G, let me call this, of this group should just be AB, a D minus B C, and this should be equal to one. This should be equal to uh, how, uh, this should give you an element in in Z P. We want its element to still be in Z P. Now, sometimes we would want to look at the behavior of such element. The trace of all these elements sometimes has a particular behavior, especially when it is a special linear group of order two. So I take an example. I take an SLC, SL2 from this group, and the SL2C from this group is also of this form, such that the such that AB minus BC should be one. Now with this particular group. We are interested in the, behavior, the general behavior of its trace. And the trace of this group, the trace of this group should not, the trace of the group J should not, when you, when you take the trace of the group, for this group, the trace of this group should, the trace of this group, SL3, to C, should be zero. Now, over here, when we take the trace, we'll be able to find out that the element, because it's in the periodic form, in ZP, the element of this may have a particular behavior when we look at the order of the group. And the, that behavior will determine how we would be able to subscribe it to the maximal abelian, uh, the maximal compactness. So in in my talk, in this talk, I am interested in working with the SL2 ZP and the SL2 QP. I am interested in working with these two because these are periodic analytic groups, analytic groups, subgroups. We are periodic analytic subgroup. And the behavior of these groups are just the behavior of how particles in physics behaves. Now, I will go back to the sharing if there are no questions. Yeah, thank you very much for very uh, detailed explanation. You're welcome. Periodic number, yeah. Yes. Now, before I move on, I would want to explain how the the, the, the particles, the fermions and the bosons come in this form. When we take a particle in, in physics, we know that every particle 
has a spin and the spin depends on the quantum state. So when I have J to the zero, we have a Higgs boson. When I have a fermion, a fermion, I will have my J to be equal to the Z set of integers over two. That's half integers. Now for a boson, a boson, I would have my J just to be the integer, set of positive integers. Now, in this talk, I am specifically interested in the behavior of the fermions, of the fermions. I will take the Z speed, the ring Z speed, and I am interested in this behavior because when we take a particle, when we take a spin half, every spin half, every spin half, real Lie algebra is just the two by two matrix is the two by two matrix in r or in c such that the trace of the matrix is zero let me write it this way is the trace of the matrix s is zero now this is how the spin half particle behaves, the, the, two, the reality algebra of a spin half. So when we take an electron or a proton or any spin half, we are expecting the Lie algebra to behave in this form. And Pauli used this principle to be able to find the uh, Pauli matrices. And from the Pauli matrices, we could see strictly, from the Pauli matrices, we could see strictly that when we have a spin half, the spin half generates the sp, s plus, s minus, and x, 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 y, and even the xz. The x plus are the raising operators, which is um, 0, 1, 0, 0, and the x minus are the lowering operators, which are the 0, 0, 1, 0. Now these operators are called the upper triangular. This is upper triangular matrix, triangular matrix. And the S minus is a lower triangle, lower triangle. Now, these two can generate all the other elements. So when I have S plus or minus, it can generate my X, of x plus or minus my x of y. It should be able to generate all these elements. Now, I was able to find an octagonal, a compact octagonal component from the x, y, and I called it the x key. So when I take my x, y, the, the matrix of my x, y um, behaves just like Pauli stated, it has an R multiplied by SK. And this, my SK, is just the compact component. So when I take the matrix SK, it is just my compact component, one, zero. Um, so I have zero, one, minus one, zero. Now, when I take a particle and I do the angular momentum, momentum coupling, the particle when in the x, y would have zero i minus i, and this x, y, I'm able to factorize the sk out by taking out the complex number and leaving it in this form. And this form, sk, is what generates the compact form of, or the compact subgroup of an Iwasawa decomposition. So it's a very important factor, which is part, which makes the spin half real algebra possible in this definition. Now, from this definition, every spin half particle or any particle in physics can be written with the classical matrices. So we have the SL. 2n mapping to the spin 
half. And these are families. All these are families. But specifically, they are the Dinkins roots. The Dinkins roots, DN. And I explained in one of my papers why the Dinkins roots, DN, corresponds to the spin path. Similarly, when we take a boson, 2n plus 1, C, which is a classical group, the boson can be found in this classical group. And where we have this to be spin J, and this is just the Dinkins root of Bn, which corresponds to the Dinkins root of Bn. And with this structure, we can be able to tell whether a particle is periodic or not. And the periodicity we shall see in the slides. Thank you. Let me continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So let me share. Okay, sorry. Let me stop pinning myself here. I think I have to unpin, remove pin, okay. Okay, share. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you. Now, okay, yeah. So, this is what I just described on the board. Now, when we have any um, particle, we can look at, we can consider the odd prime, just the odd prime of the fermion. And when we take the odd primes of the fermion, we would see that these odd primes helps us to get the structure that we have with the um, fermion on the board. Now, in this same vein, it is possible to also define the periodic for a spin particle. So we take, according to Drainford, when we have the map mu such that G by G goes to, maps to G, and it defines a mu of XY to be XY, which is a grouped structure, if G is Hamiltonian, then we say that G has a grouped Hamiltonian structure. Greenfield considered this by looking at the Poisson brackets and the symplectic nature of um, the manifold. Now, according to Robert Hooke, he also defined the periodic uh, um, Lie groups or Lie algebras using the structure of the group and the exponential function with respect to some liftings to the tangent. But in my case, I take a spin Lie group G together with its grouped Hamiltonian, and I call this the Hamilton spin Lie group. So a, a spin Lie algebra can be lifted to a Lie group, which I demonstrated and I have in my other papers. Now this Lie group, spin Lie groups, when it's having a grouped Hamiltonian structure on it, we call it a Hamilton spin Lie group. Now, examples of the Hamilton spin Lie group would be the spin half, the spin three over two, the spin five over two, and so on, for fermions. And for bosons, I only used spin one and spin two. I am careful with particle physics because I believe that in mathematics, when they talk of a spin, they use the geometry, the Clifford algebra, and just the dimensions. But I noticed that their result is not enough and convincing to particle physicists. Because in particle physics, when we say a spin half, we just mean the SU2. But in mathematics, when they want to talk about SU2, they call it a spin two. And in particle physics, spin two is just graviton. We know that spin two is for gravity. So I am of the view that particle physics has a more precise way of defining the behavior of a spin in terms of geometry than mathematics. 
Now, I go ahead to define a periodic spindly group. A periodic spindly group is just a Hamilton spindly group with a fermionic spindly group structure. So first, before a, 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 a Lie group can be periodic spindly group, or before a particle can have a periodic structure, it must first have a fermion fermionic spindly structure, which I showed in my previous papers, that if a particle admits a Clifford algebra, and it is also almost complex manifold, then this particle has a fermion spindly group structure. Now, based on this, when a particle also has a Hamilton Lee um, spin Lee group, then it is said to be periodic from the, the, the what we demonstrated on the board. Now, from this, we come to the property, a very important property that why Morita proved in, um, in periodics. And a fermionic periodic spin Lee algebra, which I note, I denote by S, the spin ZP of half, can be generated by these elements. And these are the elements that I demonstrated to you on the board and how they look like. Now, the commutation relation is also possible from the structure of um, the SL2. We can easily commute these ones, the Lie algebra of that. Now, Ray, Laser, and Corel, many others were able to show that the Iwasawa algebras exist for a special linear group of order two. Now, it is also possible that a spin, a, a fermionic spin half can also have S plus, S minus, and SZ, where S plus, S minus, and SZ are the algebras that the basis, are the basis elements that we have for the um, Lie algebraic structure for this group. Now, this basis can generate what we call the Iwasawa algebra, when we set our Planck's constant h to be 1. The reason why I set the Planck's constant h to be 1 is, in, 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 in particle physics, we know that the behavior of every experiment that we take can be perturbed when the effects can be perturbed due to the effect of the structure constant or the Planck's constant in, on it. So when we take an electron, for instance, an electron without a magnetic field or electromagnetic field just has the structure of the SL2, which we know in, in, uh, in physics, in, in mathematics. But in physics, it is not possible to only accept the fact that the structure of an electron is just an SL2C, a special linear group of order two. We have to take into consideration the Planck's constant as well as the fine structure constant. So in most of my cases, I advocate the use of the Planck's constant. And we only set it to one when we want it to behave like the classical case in mathematics. Now, Iyani was also able to prove that the principal congruent subgroup is a uniform pro P group when it has a dimension of three. He, his, his proof was done for the special linear group of order two. And this proof can also be used strictly for the spin, the periodic spin Lie group, which I have shown here. Also, when we take the Catan sub algebra of the spin Lie group, of the periodic spin Lie group, we can have this same commutation relation. And this same commutation relation would give us a mapping. And this mapping describes a, a digestion from, from the spin of this to the three-dimensional form of the ring. And this is an important factor. It is this factor that helps us understand the way we move from, um, from, from particles of to the strange nature of a particle. Now, Dinef and Sutoy, as well as Iyani, was able to show that when they take a three-dimensional ZP of an SLC, this three-dimensional is having a, quad a ternary quadratic form, which is unique up to equivalence. And this produces the Igusa local function local zeta function. 
It is also possible to construct the Igusa local zeta function for a fermion, a periodic fermion, using similar techniques from Denev. Now, when I take this periodic fermion, I have it to be the um, Z, the S minus direct product of S plus direct product of XZ. And where the bracket relation is the usual bracket relation we have. We obtain the ternary quadratic form as follows. And this is a good reduction that was proved by Denev. And this contains the Igusa local zeta functions as well. With the goose, with, the, with Denev describing strategically the ZF of the X minus two to be that from the theorem that we stated, which easily generates what was the desired result for, for Denev. Now we talk of ghost polynomials. When we talk of ghost polynomials, we are interested in the behavior of the primes of the zeta function on the whole complex plane or, or on the on the upper on the on the upper side, the upper right, upper half complex plane, or on the unit circle. Now in particle physics, I showed to you just recently that a fermion has a root system, which is just the Dinkins root system. Now the Dinkins root system BL corresponds to the fermionic and the DL also corresponds to the bosonic. The CL corresponds to quaternions. The, the, that is the symplectic form or the Hamiltonian form of a particle. The reason why I said that the only ghost polynomia associated with the fermion Lie group are these groups of this type was because we know very well that every fermion, we know very well that every fermion can generate um, what we call the bosons. When we have a half spin and a half, half plus half gives us an integer spin. So with fermions, I can generate any boson that I want. And the fermionic structure itself is symplectic because of its Poisson bracket nature, the manifold, the Poisson manifold associated with fermions. So it is very true that the fermions would have all this root system in itself, as well as these ghost polynomials. The ghost polynomials has been studied very well by Sutoy and many others. And in string theory is of importance when we are considering the boundaries or natural boundaries associated with the zeros of the, of the, of the functions. Now, every fermionic ghost polynomial can uh, are also ghost friendly, which was a straightforward proof by Denev. And we move on. Now we move to the RPQ deformed quantum algebras. With an RPQ deformity, we are interested in PQ to be positive real numbers such that the P, the Q is less than the P and the P is less than or equal to one and they are both greater than zero. Now these are meromorphic functions defined on the complex plane. Now these functions have the property that the limits, according to Hamad's formula, the limit as the soup of the function of the x plus t approaches infinity over these functions, we have one. Now, we shall look at defining linear operators on this uh, bidex, that is the dr. We take q, we, we have the mapping from xi to q of z, xi of z, and we have this. We do that for P and we have that. Now the partial derivative PQ with respect to PQ associated with this mapping also generates what we have. We have the psi of PZ minus psi of QZ, which is P minus Q or Z. And this is just the definition of the PQ calculus that we are aware of in, um, in, 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 in mathematics. Now, to define the RPQ derivative, the RPQ derivative is just the partial derivative with respect to RPQ, giving us 
P minus Q over P power Q, Q power capital Q, and the the R, which is the of P power Q and Q power Q, with respect to the partial derivative of the PQ. Based on these definitions, in my paper, which I have published, it is possible to find for any arbitrary function and any real number that the following integrals exist, or it's, it is possible to have. Now, from this theory, we, we have various mathematical definitions for the PQ calculus. And our PQ is just a, a bigger version of the PQ. In, 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 in such that in our PQ, we consider just not just the um, combinatorics involved in the calculus, but we also consider the coherent states that are involved in the functions. So when we look at the following relevant analogs, we can have the Haynes derivative, the Quain's derivative, the um, beden Han and Mark Fallen derivative, as well as the Jagannathan derivative. But the most popular of it now that is being used widely is the PQ of Jagannathan, where we can easily retrieve that result by setting our RPQ to be one. Anytime the RPQ is one, we have just the PQ Jagannathan derivative, which is defined below. Now, I move to the RPQ gamma and beta, gamma and beta functions. Before that, if there is any question I want to hear, if there is any question. If not, I can move on. Yes. Let Z, we take a Z, which is a complex number, and we define the RPQ gamma functions to be the gamma with respect to RPQ of Z to be this. This equation 5.4 is easily, um, it, it, it's easily linking to the PQ calculus when we set our um, psi one to be P and our psi two to be Q. And we put our RPQ to be one. When we set this condition, we retrieve just the gamma of the PQ. And when we set furthermore, the limit of our P to approach one, we get the Q, gamma Q function, which is also possible. Now the power basis of the RPQ and the factorial of the RPQ can also be given as bracket of N factorial to be that. Sajan in his paper was able to show for all the PQ calculus using the power basis, the power basis to describe all the pseudo subtraction and pseudo addition for, for the PQ um, power basis. This, the same technique was adapted for the RPQ and when we set our psi one and our psi two to be Q, and we set our RPQ to be one, we get the same PQ calculus that was done by Sajan. Sajan. Also from the definition that we just saw, it is we are able to define our gamma functions as below, which is the usual definition for gamma in, 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 in uh, in Q calculus, in PQ calculus, or in the classical case. Now we come to the RPQ beta functions. From the definition of the RPQ gamma function, our beta with respect to RPQ of XY is the gamma of X, gamma of Y, with divided by the gamma of X plus Y. And these are all with respect to the RPQ where our x, y are in the zp. Now, we, are, we consider the properties of the RPQ beta functions. And these properties are easily proven by Sejan and many others in the classical cases and in the Q cases, as well as the PQ cases. The RPQ cases also follow similar approach. We now move to the fermionic-piadic Q integrals. 
According to Kim and Koblitz, and Koblitz, it is possible that when we have a function that is uniformly differentiable at a point A belonging to Z, we have the following quotient function. Now, Kim was able to define a high measure, which he called mu, on these functions or on these distributions. And he was able to show that this generates the fermionic periodic Q integral, which is given by 6.1. He further showed that these are also possible when we look at the bosonic case, or he called it the Volcabon case, which is also a bosonic case. And he had the expression 6.2. From his techniques and from the PQ calculus techniques, we were able to define the R rho Q of the Volcabon integrals. And we have the following theorem. This theorem is well proven in the paper online. Now from this theorem, we now move to the periodic R rho Q gamma functions. Previously, we defined the RPQ gamma functions, but now we are interested in the periodic form of the R rho Q, where I used rho and Q instead of P and Q to avoid the confusion of the periodic, that is the P in the periodic. Now, without loss of generality, the N factorial with respect to periodic is given as this. And the gamma, we write it as follows. Now we shall also look for the periodic rho PQ factorial function, which is also given as follows. From this, Duran and many other mathematicians were able to describe the rho, the rho Q gamma functions. But I have to define the periodic version of the um, rho Q. They did for the periodic version for rho and Q, and I am doing for periodic version for RPQ. When we have rho and Q belonging to CP, where CP are just closures on my rational um, primes, the ring of rational, that's the QP. We have this modulus, rho minus one with respect to the periodic analysis to be less than one, and that of the Q minus one to be less than one also. When these conditions are satisfied, we have the rho PQ, periodic rho PQ factorial to be given as 7.1. Now, from this, we are able to find out that the following limits easily holds, especially Menken and Duran, as well as Shikov, have in their, in their write-ups and in their books that the gamma of P which is of zero is one. Similarly, if that for the RPQ, the rho PQ is also possible. We have gamma of zero to be one, periodic gamma of one to be negative one, and the modulus of the gamma of any function to be one. Now, the following theorem easily arises that the recurrence formula will hold true for every z belonging to ZP. And this is the gamma of Z plus one, giving us the delta of the delta, the periodic delta of our, our rho Q, bracket of Z, gamma, periodic gamma of our rho Q of Z, where the delta is defined as follows. From this, we have a remark that when you have the product of the KP, where P and K are different, um, are, are, different components that are products. The bracket of this is just the um, K, bracket of K and the bracket of P. Duran in 2019 and Macken in 2013 also showed that the periodic PQ as well as the Q calculus can be given as follows. The RPQ analog is the 7.1, 7.4 that we have here. We also have the lemma 7.5, which is also true for um, the sum of digits. 
where we have the series in the base of P. Now, the lemma also con continues for the bracket of N, and we have 7.6, which is also true. We go on to theorem eight, which also holds for every, uh, for, for every prime number, that is P and M, which is the sum of digits. In, and, the, and the end belonging to the, um, the series. It is possible to have the relation 7.7. .7. Consequently, we can have the follow-up relation 7.8. And this leads us to the beta RPQ, rho PQ, periodic beta functions. So for a periodic rho PQ beta function, I'm just looking at this definition 7.11. With a defi definition 7.11 and the notations, the same notations as we have seen in the previous slides. These beta functions, the periodic rho PQ beta functions also obey the same properties that we found for the classical case. And the, theory, the properties also continues from here. Now, I would like to talk about the connection with strange theory and physics. Veneziano amplitude, as we know in particle physics, is just this function. Now, this function integral 0 to 1 dx of the modulus of x that's modulus of one minus x with this, giving us the gamma of negative, if, negative alpha of x, gamma of negative alpha of t, gamma of all over the gamma of negative alpha of x and the negative alpha of t. It's just the, the um, what we call it, the amplitude that was discovered by Veneziano. And he showed that when there is cross symmetry, it is possible to have the function, the relation below, where our b, our beta infinity of the alpha of the alpha of s, alpha of t, negative alpha of s, negative alpha of t, giving us the eight, the equation eight point two. Now, when we replace the real field with p, the q, the infinity with p, we get a qp, and this is just the periodic beta functions for the classical case. This is not for the Q or the PQ or the RPQ. I noticed that Groundwell um, and many others are trying to build the PQ extensions for this, but I have developed and I'm still working on the row PQ and many applications of this in the strength theory. And this case is what makes it important to note, to learn about the um, row, row, the row Q or the periodic RPQ functions. Because when we take the Riemann zeta function, we have noticed that the Riemann zeta functions can be also written in terms of periodic which gives us that. And this was done by Wittins and Fraud in one of their papers when they were looking at the amplitude. This also takes us to periodic gravity by Dragovich and many others. They were able to show that the Einstein's equation has a periodic analog. And they described the gravitational field for this periodic analog as follows, which is the 8.6. Now, to this end, we have seen the usage of periodic numbers in strange theory. It is also used in particle physics a lot by looking at solitons, the deep brains, and many others. I am currently working on the gamma functions with string theory, and I'm looking at how it can be applied to solitons, cosmology, as well as also looking at the McDonald's poly polynomials and column branching with the quiver varieties. 
I hope um, I'm able to get enough collaborations. And also, I hope that um, we I'm able to find a lot of people to work with or those who work in this field so that we can all have a good working environment and scientific research environment. I am very much thankful. Arigato gozaimasu. And if there are many questions, I would wait for them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.